Thank you, Priyan. Uh, it is indeed an honor and a privilege that I get to chair this session. <clears throat> there are two very eminent speakers. And uh, let me introduce you uh, to the first speaker. And before doing that, just to remind you that these keynote presentations will be for 30 minutes. And after that, there's a 15 minutes uh, question and answer session. So please, the participants, please uh, type in your questions uh, in Q&A if it is accessible to you. If not, please use the chat box. Uh, we will give priority to Q&A, but if you are unable to access it, please type in your questions in the chat box as well. Thank you. So let me move on to the first speaker. It is a, an absolute honor that I get to uh, introduce the uh, introduce Professor Malik Piris, who is going to be the first speaker. Professor Malik Piris is the chair of virology at the School of Public Health. Uh, the University of Hong Kong. He's originally from Sri Lanka and we are so proud of him. He co-directs the WHO H5, H5 reference laboratory and the WHO SARS-CoV-2 reference laboratory at the University of Hong Kong. Currently, he serves as a member of the WHO International Health Regulations Emergency Committee on COVID-19. He's a, a clinical and public health virologist with a particular interest in emerging viral diseases uh, at the animal-human interface. And he uses a one health approach in his studies. Professor Piris has over 800 peer-reviewed research publications in international scientific journals, which have been cited uh, for over 76,000 times. In recognition of his research contributions, he was elected a fellow of the Royal Society of London, uh, and he, he was also recently jointly awarded the Future Science Prize in Life Sciences for contributions in pathological discoveries in severe acute respiratory syndrome, or SARS, you might remember, and its uh, zoonotic origin, which of course had implications on combating COVID-19. Professor Beeris had his undergraduate medical education in uh, Sri Lanka, that was then Ceylon, followed by postgraduate training in virology at the University of Oxford, UK. I also should add he's a fellow of the National Academy of Sciences of Sri Lanka as well. Uh, without further ado, let me invite Professor Beeris to make his presentation. Over to you, sir. Well, thank you very much, Nadira. Can you hear me okay? Yes, yes, very clear. Uh, and uh, thank you for this uh, invitation uh, to join your webinar, which in fact I joined yesterday as well. Uh, very interesting discussion. Uh, so if I can share my slides. Uh, it is on and you can make it full screen. Yes, now it's on. Yeah, right. Okay. So I actually want to pick up on uh, Dr. Palit Abhepun's last point when he talked about building back better and health security for the future, uh, but learning from the lessons of the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, you can see that I've, I've put the title as Lessons for Global Security. And I've put health within inverted commas because I think the COVID-19 pandemic has taught us that health security is global security. I mean, we heard yesterday about the impact of the pandemic on, on the economies, uh, 3 trillion US dollars lost uh, just in 2020 and, and so many other major impacts uh, which were covered by, uh, by Dr. Gunafilaki yesterday. Right, so the, what I will try to do in the next uh, 30 minutes or so is to address the question, why do we, because as uh, Palit said, this is not going to be the last pandemic. Uh, so why are we having an increasing frequency of these epidemics and pandemic threats? And how do pandemics arise and how can we avoid, preempt or better prepare for them? 
And then how can we better respond to pandemics in the future, learning from the lessons, uh, successes and failures of, of, of the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, some of the points I think uh, had, had been mentioned in terms of investment in public health, uh, one health, resource allocation, equity, leadership, trust, um, and some of these other problems that we face in today's world, such as social media, I mean, they can be problems or, or, or they can be positives depending on how we look at it. And I just want to end up with the emphasizing that things like pandemics are just one part of the bigger challenges that we face uh, on a global scale. So firstly, uh, why are we facing a increase in these epidemic and pandemic threats because over in the 1940s 50s 60s we had major uh, achievements in combating infectious diseases we had vaccines antibiotics uh, smallpox was eradicated polio is almost um, eradicated and in fact in the 1960s it, it was believed that uh, infectious diseases were more or less um, you could forget about it but uh, since then we have had major uh, infectious disease threats, uh, HIV AIDS, uh, antibiotic resistance, um, bird flu, uh, SARS in 2003, Ebola, Zika. And uh, it was obvious, you know, these were going to keep on coming. Uh, and in fact, in early 2019, um, I was part of a panel um, at a Keystone meeting discussing this topic of preparing for the next pandemic. And one of the questions was what viruses are likely to cause the next pandemic. And my answer there was that it was uh, likely to be either an influenza pandemic or a coronavirus pandemic. And unfortunately, of course, that is what it was. So what are the factors that contribute to this uh, increased frequency of emergence of new epidemics. Of course, we have the microbe itself, uh, and they have their characteristics of mutation, adaptation, but then these characteristics have been essentially the same going back thousands of years. The microbes haven't essentially changed their potential or their properties. What has changed is human activity. So, Changes in the environment, ecological degradation, deforestation, increasingly climate change will impact uh, the emergence of particularly vector-borne, mosquito-borne diseases. And then we have a whole host of human activities, of course, growth of populations, urbanization, more, we are more crowded together, which means uh, uh, infections can spread more rapidly. Um, travel, international travel means that any outbreak that starts anywhere in the world can be a problem everywhere within 24 hours. Uh, international trade, uh, intensive livestock industry. Uh, at the moment, we have something like 80 billion livestock consumed annually. And these are raised in, in very large scale, uh, very industrialized type of settings, not the backyard village settings that even 50 or 60 years ago uh, many of us were used to. And also many of these um, uh, strain, I mean, even if you look at, for example, chicken that are raised, they are genetically very homogeneous. They are bred for very specific properties. And in most parts of the world, the, 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 the genetic stock is more or less the same. So it's identical, uh, which means that a virus that emerges, really, if it successfully emerges, uh, into that population, it has unlimited potential to spread. Then we have the wild animal trade, and I'll talk more about that. The pet trade, you'll be surprised uh, how extensive that is internationally. Uh, antibiotic abuse, breakdown of public health, lack of political will, uh, human behavior changes. Uh, so all of these things are really human activities that are increasing the risk of emergence of uh, epidemics from animals to humans, and a few of them, of course, has potential for pandemic spread. So this is just uh, to show you, for example, this is the human population. 
And this, for example, is the, the, the rate of increase of production of poultry, and here the increase in travel over the last number of years. Now, um, as uh, was mentioned, I, I was involved in the 2003 outbreak of SARS, which emerged from Southern China and came through Hong Kong. And uh, uh, after uh, identifying the virus and tackling the human outbreak, we were interested to try to understand where this virus came from. Uh, and uh, uh, together with uh, one of my colleagues, Yi Guan, who sampled these wild game animal markets in Guangdong, uh, found evidence of a virus that is almost identical to SARS in these uh, game animal markets, in animals like the civet cats, uh, raccoon dogs, and, and things like that. And when, when we tested the blood of people working in these game animal markets, many of them had antibody to SARS, although they never had the disease of SARS, uh, meaning the severe acute respiratory disease, but they, they obviously had been infected with a related virus. So clearly this was where the jump from animals to humans took place. Um, but then uh, it was later found that these animals in nature do not carry this virus. And uh, it was these small rhinolophus bats that were shown to carry the virus. And these bats also being sold in these massive game animal markets uh, allowed the virus to jump from bats to these animals, persist in these animals, uh, and repeatedly expose humans until such time as the virus adapted to then spread in humans. And that is how that outbreak started. So at that time, uh, uh, convincing the Guangdong authorities to close these animal markets almost certainly prevented the re-emergence of SARS. You remember that the human outbreak, luckily, uh, was contained within four or five, uh, within six months, essentially, the transmission in humans worldwide was halted. Uh, but if these markets had not been closed, uh, following the evidence that was uh, presented to them, the outbreak would have re-emerged from this. I'm almost certainly sure of that. So that intervention prevented the reemergence of that 2003 SARS virus. Now, of course, um, um, I think the question was raised, I heard yesterday, uh, as to the emergence of the COVID-19 or the SARS coronavirus 2. And uh, the question was raised yesterday as to whether this was a man-made virus. Uh, and I can very clearly and categorically state that no coronavirologist who understands the virology of coronaviruses did believe or does believe that it was a man-made virus. Uh, I mean, that is completely impossible. And in fact, even the CIA, which uh, the pre President Biden commission to investigate uh, the origins of SARS, because this issue sadly had got so politicized, in their report, they also ruled out man-made origin of the virus, uh, meaning an engineered virus. Now, of course, whether the virus escaped from a lab is a, is a different question, and we can discuss that because it's something that you can never disprove. Uh, but uh, anyway, if anyone wants to discuss it, I'm happy to discuss it uh, in the discussion period. But I think it is, it is sad to say that the reason why it got so politicized and distorted was because um, very powerful politicians in very powerful countries wanted to divert their own local public attention from their failures to try to find uh, you know, some, uh, some other person to blame. Um, so that is sadly, uh, you know, where we are. And sadly, also, it has led to a major um, um, uh, disruption in, in the relations between two of the most uh, powerful countries in the world today. Now, this wild animal trade is something that is extremely extensive. And I, I think many of us don't appreciate uh, how extensive it is. Uh, this, for example, is an endangered species. Uh, which gets trafficked all across the world, uh, particularly coming out of Indonesia. Um, and um, and it's, uh, this trade is therefore not only causing health risks, but it's also driving extinction of species and loss of biodiversity. A study that was done some years ago uh, found that over a 10-year period, 1.5 billion 
animals were imported into the United States. Uh, and some of these are wildlife. So clearly you have a huge uh, uh, potential for trans transferring um, uh, infections from one part of the world to another. And very recently, in fact, this month, there was a study done uh, in the wildlife trade in China, where they, they sampled something like uh, 2,000 animals that, are, that, are, uh, that were being traded, and they identified 102 different viruses, 65 discovered for the first time. And 21 of these were considered to be potentially high risk to humans and, or to other domestic animals. Now, these civet cats, if you remember, I told you this was uh, one of the animals that were re responsible for the uh, emergence of SARS in 2003, was one of the species that carried the highest number of these uh, risky viruses. And there were, a number of, uh, there were evidence of a number of species jumps from bats to civets, from bats to hedgehogs, birds to porcupines, dogs to raccoon dogs, and also, of course, in the reverse direction humans are, are transferring viruses back to wildlife as well. So this is where the One Health uh, approach becomes so important. I mean, we are talking about essentially human problems uh, in terms of human health, but you cannot tackle these problems of human health by just uh, staying in our human health silo, because as I showed you, these involve interactions with animal health, wild animal health, and environmental health as well. Now, I would now try to turn to come back to our global response to these uh, emerging epidemics and pandemics. After SARS in 2003, the world did wake up to the fact that an epidemic anywhere can become a, a threat everywhere. And in response to that, the WHO came up with the international health regulations, the revised international health regulations. And, uh, and that was signed up by almost every country in the world in the uh, International Health Assembly. Uh, and the commitments uh, uh, as part of that agreement were that countries were expected to develop the capacity to detect, to report unusual and unexplained outbreaks of disease, develop the capacity to respond to these threats, and also the capacity to monitor and surveil these threats. So, um, but uh, just a few years ago, when uh, 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 an estimate was made as to how many countries, even according to themselves, even according to their own um, uh, confidence, less than half the countries uh, said that they were they had achieved these uh, competencies, but clearly, uh, as you can imagine, these are absolutely essential if uh, we are going to be able to uh, reduce the risk of uh, future pandemics going forward. And uh, the Johns Hopkins University, um, they have a thing called the Global Health Security Index, and um, in fact, they ranked the United States as the most prepared country in the world, uh, according to their uh, Global Health Security Index. But I think uh, if you look at the response of the United States to the pandemic, uh, one can certainly not say that they were, or by any means, are uh, the best prepared uh, country in the world to face the pandemic, or of this pandemic, or the future pandemics mm -hmm. as well. Then, of course, after the Ebola outbreak, uh, if you remember, which took place in, in West Africa in 2014, 2015, again, there was a flurry of activity and multiple reports. And, and in particular, this particular report from, uh, commissioned by the National Academy of Sciences of the uh, National Academy of Medicine of the United States. Uh, and in fact, this uh, commission uh, was headed by a banker, uh, Peter Sands, who, who was previously the, the head of Standard Chartered Bank. So, and, and their report was titled, A Neglected Dimension of Global Security. Again, note, not global health security, global security, a framework for countering infectious diseases. And they, they went on to highlight the, the failure of the current model for developing countermeasures, particularly vaccines and drugs, based on the current uh, pharmaceutical 
company type of model, because which pharmaceutical company is going to invest in developing vaccines and drugs for potential pandemic candidates when there is no certainty that that particular pathogen is going to actually cause a pandemic. So they pointed out that there is a need, I mean, they costed the impact of a, a future pandemic. And they said that uh, it would be economically extremely prudent to invest something like 4 billion US dollars annually to enhance uh, uh, the, the development of vaccines and drugs for these potential epidemic and pandemic threats coming out of nature, uh, coming out of wildlife and, and domestic animals in, in, in particular. Now, uh, together with that, and maybe in response to that, there was an initiative called CEPI. Uh, this was funded, uh, I think initiated quite a lot by, by the government of Norway, joined uh, by, by Japan, and uh, to some extent India as well. Uh, and uh, they uh, contributed the money and, 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 and they came up with this essentially to try to identify what are the potential viruses that might cause uh, future pandemics and develop vaccines uh, for these preemptively before they become pandemic. So some of the things on their list actually included SARS coronavirus and also MERS coronavirus and a few other, there were eight uh, pathogens that they were focusing on. And MERS coronavirus, which if you remember is, is in the same family as COVID, as the virus that causes COVID-19, uh, was at that time causing problems in the, in the Middle East. And uh, one of the groups who were, who were funded to develop vaccines for MERS coronavirus was the University of Oxford group. And indeed, it is that development, uh, trying to develop a vaccine for MERS, that they were able to pivot very quickly to, to, to SARS coronavirus, because these are essentially uh, very related viruses. So the investment that, that, that uh, CEPI had put in to developing a vaccine for MERS was fundamental in developing what is now called the University of Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. And this is some of the team members there. And, uh, it, and in fact, one of the clinicians who was responsible for uh, a number of those clinical studies of the Oxford vaccine is a Sri Lankan, in fact, uh, Maheshi Ramasamy. And then, of course, in parallel, there was the uh, uh, development of the RNA virus technology. And uh, it is important to note that um, these RNA uh, virus vaccines, whether they were, you know, what is called the Pfizer vaccine um, 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 and the Moderna vaccine. Now, the Pfizer did not develop the vaccine. It was actually developed by a company called BioNTech, a very small biotech company. And the brains behind that was this lady, uh, Kathleen Kariko, who is Hungarian born. Uh, she finished her PhD in Hungary, went to the United States to do her postdoc. And in 2005, she made a very important uh, uh, discovery. She was trying to understand how you can inject RNA into cells uh, without triggering uh, ab uh, abnormal response uh, in, in the cells to, to the RNA. Uh, and that was, at that time, she was not thinking of vaccines. She was thinking of very basic fundamental research. But it is that research really that was the foundation for the RNA vaccines that we are using today. But it's interesting also that she never succeeded in becoming a professor in the United States. Uh, and ultimately, she had to leave the United States and, and go to Germany. And that's how she uh, was involved in the, um, the, the BioNTech company, which actually developed the vaccine. Pfizer essentially just scaled up and marketed it. And similarly, the other RNA vaccine, Moderna, also is a very small company. So these were not developed by the large uh, pharma companies uh, that, uh, that, that you might think about. But then uh, Dr. Palita Bekun, of course, also mentioned the, the, the uh, the, the tragedy of, uh, of vaccine delivery. I mean, one of the triumphs, of course, of the pandemic was the speed with which these very safe and very effective vaccines were developed. But um, um, I don't have to remind you of the statistics. I mean, 9.5 billion doses administered as of the end of January, but uh, 36 states have vaccinated less than 10% of the population. Uh, and there is a huge inequity, as you can see here, 
in uh, vaccine delivery and how, how we can uh, do better in the future, I think is going to be a major challenge. Now, this of course has been a hot topic of discussion and, and uh, there is, uh, uh, I mean, there's a lot of discussion about patents and, and uh, intellectual property issues and things like that. But um, I mean, it's obviously very easy to try to focus on, on something like that. But I think uh, it is a much bigger issue than just intellectual property. I think we do need to develop regional vaccine, vaccine manufacturing capacity in different parts of the world. For example, Africa has 17% of the global population, but only 1% of vaccine manufacturing capacity. Um, and and yesterday, I think we heard uh, from uh, Professor Mukherjee a very interesting comment about the, the Indian uh, experience with, uh, with uh, vaccination. I mean, the State Serum Institute, as he mentioned, was one of, is one of the global powerhouses of, uh, of vaccine production. And uh, they, they, in fact, uh, did a great job in, in linking up with AstraZeneca uh, and also with another company called Novavax very early in 2020, and, and, and they were they were going to, I think, uh, uh, make a huge contribution to the global vaccine supply. But um, as uh, Professor Mukherjee pointed out, um, um, this was again, one of those examples where uh, bad political judgments, uh, misunderstanding of science led to very bad decisions. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, he, he, he went through that story. Um, so I think we, we really have to uh, enhance global vaccine capacity, even in peacetime. Uh, and, and we also need other things. For example, we need stronger and harmonized regulatory authorities. Again, if you look at the situation in, across Africa, each country has its own regulator, which can permit or, or, uh, or um, uh, accept a vaccine for uh, for uh, use in that country. And, and that makes it very difficult uh, because many of those countries don't have strong regulatory authorities. So uh, right now there is a, there is a, a in, a initiative to try to have a pan-African regulatory uh, authority. Uh, and I think we also have to strengthen biomedical research infrastructure. Now, again, one of the, one of the, one of the triumphs, I think, of the pack to come out of the pandemic is the, this COVAX facility. Now, uh, I mean, of course, it has not delivered all the vaccines that we would like to the world, but the fact that it had been thought about and, and they did all the right things, uh, but unfortunately, they did not have uh, sufficient funding to, to, do, uh, to, to do the job as effectively as they would have liked to do. So again, it's a, it's a great initiative, but it's something that uh, clearly has to be strengthened much further with global uh, uh, international commitment uh, uh, and more funding going into it as well. So um, last year, there was in fact an independent panel for pandemic preparedness and response. So this was led by Helen, Helen Clark uh, and, and a panel of other people. And uh, these are some of the recommendations to come out of it. And this last one is what I have been talking about. For example, the issue of uh, pre-negotiated platforms for tools and supplies for immediate health responses, particularly countermeasures such as vaccines and drugs. But then that's uh, not the only one. Uh, there are many other important things. Invest in preparedness now to prevent the next crisis. Uh, raise new international funding for pandemic preparedness and response. So you remember, this was also something that was pointed out by the National Academy of Medicine Commission uh, in, in 2018. Uh, much better surveillance systems uh, for, for new disease outbreaks. Strengthen the independence, authority, and financing of WHO. Now again, WHO is also one of those organizations that many people found it very easy to criticize. Again, when they found uh, problems, uh, their own failures, um, as I told you, uh, you always try to blame somebody else. And, and WHO was also one of the places that was blamed. But I must say, and since I have 
I'm not from WHO, but I certainly have worked with WHO going back to 2003, SARS, uh, et cetera. I mean, WHO has done quite a good job. I'm not saying anybody has done a perfect job. You know, we, we all have uh, failings that we have to learn from. But if you, if you compare how, how well many countries have done, particularly big countries, I think WHO has probably done a better job than most of them. But we have to accept the fact that from what I heard, and if Palita is on the line, he can correct me. What I understand is that the total budget for WHO for all its global activities, not just the pandemic, I'm talking about everything it does about communicable diseases, vaccination, non-communicable diseases, heart disease, uh, and everything annually is of the order of what a big hospital in the United States would get for a year. So how can we expect uh, very much more from WHO if it is not properly funded uh, with independence to develop a strong uh, infrastructure? Secondly, we have to, uh, people may not understand, but WHO really has no power to walk into a country and demand uh, information or specimens or, or anything. It has no international power to demand anything of any country. All it can do is to persuade. So this is exactly what uh, the, the independent panel is saying. Strengthen the independence, authority, and financing of WHO. And I think that is extremely important. Then elevate pandemic preparedness and response to the highest levels of political leadership. Now, usually health matters are, are regarded as not so important. I mean, it, it's, it's believed to be a, a economically draining activity and, and left to more junior ministers to do. Uh, but I think pandemic uh, COVID-19 has clearly showed that uh, it, it affects every aspect uh, of uh, economies, society, and uh, um, our, our whole lives. And also that national pandemic co coordinators have a direct line to heads of state or governments. So these are some of the things that um, the independent panel itself has recommended that uh, have to be done so that uh, we can respond better to future pandemics. Now, so one of the things that uh, in fact, that we, uh, some of our own research back before the pandemic, in fact, we were interested in how viruses transmit from people to people. And uh, we were studying influenza and coronaviruses. And we showed that um, uh, what we had is people, uh, people with infections breathing into an apparatus where we could measure the virus coming out and the particle sizes that were coming out from their breath. So we could show that the other coronaviruses that have been circulating in humans come out of human breath, uh, both in large particles and small particles. And importantly, we show that if we have the same person wearing a surgical mask, essentially you remove the infectious virus from the air. So that together with the fact that the understanding that COVID-19 could be transmitted even before people become symptomatic uh, led to the, the recommendation to, to wear a surgical mask, uh, not just to protect yourself from getting infected, but because anybody may be infected without knowing it and to reduce transmission to others. So that was the basis of that recommendation. And more recently, of course, the US CDC has come out with this guidance uh, with a large ecological study where they were able to show that even a simple cloth mask reduces uh, transmission by about 56%, a surgical mask by 66%, and uh, uh, N95 mask even better. But again, we have powerful global <laughs> leaders taking completely contrary views to, um, to very simple public health measures. And this led to the New England Journal of Medicine, which is probably the most prestigious um, uh, medical journal in the world uh, at the end of 2020 to write this editorial. And it's headed dying in a leadership vacuum. And in fact, it was the most sharp indictment of an international leader, and in this case of President Trump, that I've ever seen any medical uh, journal writing. So it just shows that leadership is important. 
and science-based decision make, uh, making is absolutely important. And I think uh, that again is a point that was made by uh, 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 Professor Mukherjee yesterday. In the same way, we, we have the issues of um, clinical trials uh, to, to recommend drugs uh, for use. I won't go into the, it in detail, but um, uh, it is extremely important to have large scale randomized clinical trials to decide whether a particular drug is effective or not. And uh, that is how, for example, uh, uh, these uh, particularly led from the UK, uh, showing some of these drugs such as dexamethasone to be effective, whereas other drugs such as hydroxychloroquine uh, to show that there has no effect at all. Then we have the supply chain issues, things like masks and, and other uh, essential goods. Uh, and, and this again was something that was pointed out long before the pandemic that a pandemic such as this is going to hugely impact supply chains uh, and is going to really disrupt uh, um, both health uh, and needed items as well as the whole economic supply chain system. Then of course we have other issues such as contact tracing and now we have uh, the possibilities of uh, much more um, intrusive surveillance such as digital surveillance or mobile surveillance and things like that. And, and there are of course benefits of this uh, as has been shown in many countries, but there are also risks in terms of personal privacy. So we have to address that. And then we also have to consider this issue of balancing individual rights versus collective benefits. And, and what I'm showing here is the protests in, in Canada where a small group of uh, truckers are, are protesting the uh, compulsory vaccination of people who, who uh, travel across international borders. And uh, finally, I think we, we really have to uh, uh, deal with this uh, whole problem of social media and, and uh, what is truth. Um, so uh, this whole question of uh, uh, rumors and absolute misinformation, which can be spread extremely rapidly and unfortunately, many people are um, very susceptible to believing this means that dealing with pandemics becomes a major problem. But of course, this is not something only for pandemics. Uh, it is a problem in, in many other areas of life. Uh, and, and we really have to work out how to do this better. And in fact, uh, it, I would strongly recommend if you haven't seen this movie called Contagion, that you do watch it. It's a movie that was made, I think, 13 or 15 years ago. But all these problems, including the problems of uh, social media uh, and so many of the other problems that we actually faced during COVID-19 was foreseen back at that time and very, very accurately shown uh, in this movie. So I think, unfortunately, we cannot say that we were not warned. All these problems that we were facing in, in the pandemic have been well predicted uh, way before the event. Uh, so the longer term impacts of the pandemic, um, I don't know how much of time I have, uh, but I'll try to be quick. The social psychological impacts have been pointed out. So vaccines are good at preventing getting disease, but uh, we really have a need to boost our morale as well. The economic impacts and supply chains I talked about, the increase in inequality has been talked about, and I think will be talked about again, and educational and development impact on children, the longer term effects of COVID-19, what is called long COVID, we still don't fully understand the impact of that. And then of course, the impact of the pandemic on, on affecting other routine healthcare, sort of blood pressure, hypertension, diabetes, and, and all these other uh, uh, Routine uh, care delivery has been affected, as well as childhood vaccinations have been affected. Uh, the misinformation campaign problems. And of course, uh, there have been positives as well. So for example, the understanding that people can work from home, for example, quite effectively um, can be a positive. Um, it means less um, pollution, less traffic on the road, and, and maybe things that uh, we can um, uh, keep even after the pandemic finishes. But then, as I said, I want to end talking about uh, beyond pandemics. Now, uh, as I told you, the, the emergence of pandemics is because we, we really are living beyond, uh, I mean, it, it's all because of things that we humans do 
that are disrupting the ecosystems uh, uh, and the biodiversity uh, of our planet. And this is not purely pertaining to pandemics because this also pertains to uh, what we are doing in terms of polluting our environment, in terms of air pollution, uh, in terms of climate change. So we really are living beyond the means of our planet, beyond the sustainable uh, capacity of our planet. And in nature, nothing can grow forever. So I don't, you know, I think, uh, I mean, our, our obsession with perpetual growth uh, of GDPs uh, is not, I think, some, something that is sustainable. So I think we risk rupturing the limits of planetary sustainability unless as a global community, we change our way to develop. And uh, so a way forward to a better sustainable future. So this is a very, very good article that um, uh, is pub uh, 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 published by Hinchcliffe and others. And I would strongly recommend that you read it. And what they say is that COVID-19 is a symptom and not the cause. It's a symptom of planetary dysbiosis, habitat destruction, illegal wildlife trade, poor practices in livestock production and non-sustainable lifestyles. And they say, we need to recalibrate our values and rewards, a, a shift away from self-care to systems that help sustain the One Health and planetary health uh, uh, perspectives, to move away from human exceptionalism, to be less anthropocentric, meaning that we, we, we should not think of planet Earth as just focused on supporting humankind. We really have a whole, uh, ecosystem to try to support. The importance of public health, one health and planetary health perspectives, balance individual versus the collective, uh, inequalities uh, and uh, so many other things. But I will, I think I will, I will just uh, quickly go on to, to finally just to reflect that historically uh, during the 2003 SARS crisis, during the 2008 financial crisis, or in, for example, eradicating smallpox, even at that time, in, in spite of Cold War rivalries between the, the West and, and the Soviet Union, the world came together to tackle many of these crises at that time. But unfortunately, in COVID-19, that global cooperation failed. Uh, e even if you compare it with the global cooperation during the 2008 financial crisis, with COVID-19, we had none of that. And why was that? Uh, my own feeling is that it was the leadership uh, at the, at the, at, in the most important countries in the world that was different. But um, essentially, the science was exemplary. And personally, I know that scientific collaboration was excellent. But uh, at the political level, uh, it was far from excellent. So I think uh, I'll just end with this. Uh, I mean, of course, uh, nobody exactly knew what Mahinda Thera told uh, King Devan Ampiyatissa, but uh, I think this is a quote by Anuja Fernando. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it goes, uh, oh great king, the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth have an equal right to live and move about in any part of the land as thou. The land belongs to the people and all living beings. Thou art only the guardian of it. And I think uh, we would all do well to remember that and live by that uh, precept. And thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, yeah. Professor Piris, for, for sharing your you. extensive yeah. insights uh, and knowledge with the rest of us. Uh, I think we can take only a couple of very quick questions uh, if uh, I think uh, can we put up the slide very quickly yes uh, so the first question is and uh, please uh, a very quick answer if possible can we uh, dream that there will be a phasing out of COVID-19 by mid 2022 uh, or is it too early, at least by end of this year? Yeah, so I, I think um, essentially, uh, uh, 
the Omicron variant that is spreading worldwide now, uh, of course, it is causing some major challenges, but it, it is, as long as it is spreading in a vaccinated population, uh, we have a lot of evidence to suggest that vaccine followed by natural infection, particularly with a mild virus like this, provides a big boost to the immunity and also broadens our immunity uh, beyond just Omicron or beyond the old virus or beyond Delta or whatever. It broadens immunity to cover, uh, hopefully, even future variants. So I think the combination of vaccination and natural infection over time at a population level will bring us, I think, to a much better uh, uh, level of population protection uh, uh, to the future variants that may come. But I don't think that the virus is going to disappear. As I think uh, Palita mentioned, it is going to be with us for forever, essentially. Um, but uh, the, the human immunity will be much better. So I think we should be able to, to move out of the, um, the acute response phase, as Palita put it, to the more sustained control Thank phase, you. certainly by the end of the year. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, that was the question by Arya Sumanasinghe. And the next one, very quickly, from Professor Priyan Dias. Uh, uh, do you think it's, it'll be better to promote role of science advisors? Or uh, do you think scientists can become politicians and uh, help the situation? I, I think we, well, I mean, I, you know, I. I scientists definitely have to be able to communicate very effectively to the general public and to politicians. But politicians have their role. And I, I, I mean, of course, there's nothing to stop scientists becoming politicians. And, and indeed, uh, you know, for example, the success of places like Germany is because, uh, you know, people like Angela Merkel came from a scientific background. Uh, sadly, many of the global leaders don't come from a scientific background, and that is uh, that is a disadvantage. But I think you know politicians have a bigger perspective. Uh, they have to balance many issues, but they have to be scientifically literate, and that is where I think we we really have a challenge. And the challenge is both sides. I mean, I think as scientists, we have to be much better able to communicate in a way that that uh, non-scientists understand, but equally politicians really have to respect uh, the scientific community. But what I really fear is that in many parts of the world, um, experts, not just scientists, I mean, experts are becoming uh, marginalized. I mean, you know, they're almost being regarded as the enemy. And, and this is really very concerning and, and we really have to deal with that. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Pires. I think we'll have to let you go uh, because of the time constraints.